Hello there and welcome to the first ever landscape painting episode on my YouTube channel, or so I think. Uh, this is titanium white, ivory black, ultramarine blue, green shade, terra vert, yellow ochre, Windsor yellow deep, Windsor red, alizarin permanent, magenta, and dioxazine purple. And the canvas that we're working on today is just a regular old cotton canvas. So just like the other episodes, this is going to be a little bit longer. So feel free to get your drawing materials, your painting materials, your acrylic, your watercolor, your oil paints, and let's make a little painting together or drawing. I'm using Outerless Mineral Spirits and my medium of choice today is this one right here hopefully it will zoom gambling solvent free fluid and i read one of the comments earlier uh, today and on my previous video about mediums so someone was asking about mediums in a video talking about them so i figured it's not that complicated to talk about so i can answer the question on the medium so the solvent free fluid by gambling I use it mainly because it's a little bit of a slow dryer for me. So it's much slower drying than um, like an alkyd medium. So let's get into the next one that I use. So this is the other one. This is the Liquin Light Gel. So Liquin and Neo McGillip, the other medium that I use all the time, um, you can see this one's kind of crusty, but it still works. It's just like the Neo McGillip, as in it handles the same. The only reason I'll use this over the other mediums is just because this is the fastest drying medium. Neo McGillip is just a little bit slower drying than this, but handling wise, it is the same. Now the next medium, and uh, more recently, this is kind of like my favorite medium, though it's kind of expensive. This is Rublev Venetian Medium. So I realize I'm going over two minutes now talking about the mediums, but uh, just to answer the question about why I use certain mediums, this one I like because it is a fast dryer. It dries at about the same rate as Neo McGill, but not as fast as a liquid. Um, but it's, uh, as you can read here, well, hopefully uh, it's clear, a gel medium of ground leaded crystal glass. So it has lead in it. And it also has, I don't know if we can zoom, I don't know if it zooms, but either way, it has lead and it has a little bit of turpentine in it. So this has a much thicker body uh, when you use it to paint. And I like to use this in layers, not so much for an ala prima, so to speak. But it's, it has a thicker body to the paint and uh, I can work in layers with it. Alright, let's set the autofocus to manual now. So we're going to only focus on the canvas. So it's toned with a little bit of odorless mineral spirits and ivory black. So with landscape, with the photo reference you're seeing on the top left corner there, that photo reference was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, Manassas, uh, Virginia, uh, Bull Run, Battle of Bull Run um, area. So. I prefer to work from life. Um, I was actually painting a plein air painting this week, earlier this week, so these paints are what I used in that plein air painting. But anyway, enough talking. <laughs> Let's get to the actual painting. So I like to use a grayish tone to start with and ivory black to draw. So see how the canvas is already kind of slick? So with a bristle brush, I should be able to erase, see that, a little bit. Now I chose the ivory black over the burnt umber and as you notice I don't have a brown in here because I would rather just mix that color myself. Um, so I choose to use ivory black to draw with in the beginning just because the drawing color usually has some kind of impact on the um, the way the painting will look in the end. So I'd rather have a little bit of a gray touch to the painting, a landscape painting that is, than uh, say a brown one. Just because, I, I don't know, it's winter over here and maybe we want a little bit of a cooler touch. So with landscape, 
I have been practicing a lot uh, these days. If you've been following me on Instagram, you'll see that um, our previous few posts have been about uh, have been on landscape paintings and I, I try to keep this philosophy in my mind with landscape that it's a little bit more relaxing a little bit more forgiving than portrait and I try to think about just in the beginning not so much drawing even though technically I am drawing but rather I'm thinking of composing with each brushstroke you follow me I think about composing with each brushstroke rather than drawing with landscape. So right now I'm just setting the little uh, distant field in the background of the, um, the trees. We're going to talk a little bit about atmospheric perspective. Though this is a photo reference, the atmospheric perspective and the colors has, have been flattened out by the photo reference, but that's okay. Now, I'm putting in the distant trees in the background as just a simple little shape. And just like with portrait painting, you want to think about simple shape. Now, especially with landscape painting, you want to be very uh, simple with how you state the masses. The most important thing in, in this stage is the abstract and having an idea of what the... Um, the composition, the overall composition will look like. So there's a little uh, tree, well not a little tree, but there's a tree way back in the distance, but that's a little bit closer. And rather than center that little tree, I think it's centered um, on the photo reference, but I'm gonna put it a little bit off to the side over here. So a little bit more paint. There you go, put this little tree right over here now the tree is a little bit darker on the photo reference and in nature i think it would also be a little bit darker so when things get closer to you in the landscape they also get a little bit darker and you also start to see a little bit more of the warm tones more of the earthy colors the warmer earthy colors but way back in the distance um, you have more cooler colors and lighter values with landscape. So let's put this second little plane here. And just like with portrait, you want to use plane as much as possible. Now there is a shadow being casted from this tree. There's a big old tree right here. I don't know if I cropped it out in the photo reference. I might have cropped it out, but if I didn't crop it out, there's a little dark thing over here. And it's a tree that's kind of awkwardly cropped in the corner. So I'm gonna choose to omit the tree that is kind of awkwardly in the corner. Like I was saying, I don't think too much about drawing. I think more about composing with each brush stroke. So let's get this little basic shape for the tree. Nothing too complex. It's not like painting a human portrait. Not at all. No one's going to say that we didn't get the likeness of the tree, although I'm sure someone will write that in the comments. But it's a very relaxing exercise. So there we have a simple, basic little shape for the tree. And the tree has a cast shadow, that is a shadow being projected onto this tall grass. And now the tree is casting a shadow, a very nice looking shadow, at I'd say, I don't know, maybe a 30 degree angle Watch out for 45s and 90s in nature. I'm sure 90s occur, or sorry, 45 degrees occurs in nature, but I try to avoid it, uh, 45 degree angles. And I definitely try to avoid 90 degree angles. And another thing you want to watch out for uh, when composing a landscape. See, as landscape painters, we are composers. 
sure someone's gonna write something in the comments to the contrary for me, but oh well, that's YouTube. But in any case, you also want to watch out for symmetry. So see all this space here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the other cast shadow being casted by a tree way back in the distance. There would be a tree over there casting this shadow. So it's going to be in the same kind of way. Now remember, a linear perspective, so two lines that are parallel, eventually will meet in a, um, I don't know, a single point. Not saying that these two trees would be perfectly matched up with one another, but we're going to just invent that. See, we're composing. Now let's go ahead and put in some of these darker values. Of course, that might be too dark, but it's okay. A nice thing about ivory black is that it's a very slow dryer. It's not going to settle into the surface quite as much as burnt umber. And when we have all of these sh shapes, all of these masses stated, uh, that is the masses of light and dark and light and shade, then we'll be able to go in with color right on top of this. So this is kind of like a mix between classical and alla prima. Alla prima meaning uh, wet on wet. So let's go ahead and start to compose a little tree. A little dangling arm for the tree. And then there's a bunch of mass over here. So remember, you're composing. So in the photo reference, the tree, the placement of the tree doesn't matter to me as much. Even if I were out there plein air painting, the placement of the tree wouldn't matter to me as much as the placement on the canvas. Now don't get me wrong, I still want to stick to um, what I'm seeing in nature, but I don't wanna slavishly copy what I'm looking at with the landscape. I want to interpret visual information and create a painting, just like with portrait, but with much more freedom. So a little arm going over there. Keep these shapes nice and simple. Now since this tree is closer to me, atmospheric perspective will tell me that it's gonna be darker. Now, if I misuse any terms, uh, those of you that are experts uh, with landscape painting, if I misuse any terms, you can go ahead and correct me. I don't claim to be as knowledgeable with landscape painting as I am with portrait. I don't claim to be that knowledgeable with portrait either, but I do have 11 years experience with that. But it takes a lifetime, really, to to master something. So a little bit darker here. Now you're seeing how we're starting to pull this abstraction together into a composition that we enjoy. Now when we have a composition that we enjoy, that's what will inspire us to continue to work. So just unifying the masses here. I don't want to put any details Details are kind of useless at this point. Now there's a distant trail. Actually, I remember walking on that trail. Over here. Simple little shape. There. Okay. So now that we have the composition all mapped out, we're just under 15 minutes here. Now we're going to be able to have some fun with this. Now with the same old brush, what I'm gonna do is just clean it with um, odorless mineral spirits that's directly beneath here, so you can't really see what I'm doing. Just cleaning off the brush with the odorless mineral spirits. Here's a piece of paper towel. Now I'm gonna make my life rather simple. So this is ultramarine green shade. So it's like ultramarine blue, but it has a little bit of a warmer tone to it and so I don't have to worry too much about putting a greenish color in the sky or a yellowish color in the sky. 
The sky is not straight blue. Usually isn't, but what we can do is use a bluish tone that already has something warm in it. So now you're seeing how it's just easily just flowing. So the surface is wet and it enables me to create very swift and smooth brush strokes. See that? We're already going to start to indicate some simple little clouds here. So if you want to work with zigzag, a zigzag type motion, crisscross motion, whichever kind of motion you feel, but just whatever you do, don't paint straight or horizontal. Nature doesn't like that. And who am I to say what nature doesn't like? After all, we are composing. Now, even with the sky, even with the clouds, I'm very focused on placement and abstraction. So, I don't want the clouds, though they look almost the same, this cloud and this cloud in the picture, I don't want them to look that similar in the painting and even there's a little cloud over here just just seeping into the background I don't want them to be exactly the same so what I'll do is when I get into the white you'll see I'll make one cloud distinct from the other you're seeing how easily the ultramarine green shade goes into the background. Just a nice and simple little tone. Now there are going to be purists out there that will, will probably yell at me uh, with this, but this is a simplification. When you're out there doing plein air, time is everything. So what you don't want to do is spend so much time trying to draw it and get it as perfect as possible. You want to spend a lot of time experiencing the moment with plein air, with landscape. Okay, so now what I'm going to do with the same old brush, get a little bit of the titanium white. And now we're going to start to describe the clouds. zigzag motion, crisscross motion, whichever. So shadow is not as important with a cloud. I would try to make it just flat. Now clearly a shadow on a cloud will help to describe form and sometimes you can automatically create a shadow just by the way you apply the brush stroke. Whoops. So what I would recommend is to just kind of let the paint flow with the shadow. Don't think about the shadow as much. Think about the abstraction. Now remember I said that I would differentiate the clouds. So this one is going to have maybe like a Z, like Dragon Ball Z. Like it's going to have a Z. And this one is going to have I don't know really. Th this one is going to have some kind of like a shoe, like a high heel. So there's the heel, there's the flat. And you go down to the, the toes. So this one is like a, a heel. And maybe the boot is going down like this. Yeah, something like that. You can make up these stories in your head. Now go back to the blue. And now you can add some more interesting stuff. You can add some depth to the background of the sky. And of course, I'm mixing the white now with the blue. So I'm mixing color right on the canvas. So this is something that will kind of help you save time when you're out there plein air painting. I highly encourage you to go out and paint landscape. The only reason I'm 
indoors using a photo reference right now is just because I have to film this in a way that you can hear me. Now I've been playing around with the idea in my head of uh, you know traveling and painting plein air, traveling and painting people, um, but I really would need a camera crew for that, or at least a camera person doing that all on my own. Though isn't impossible, but it would be a lot with the batteries for the camera, the you know, all the technical stuff. Okay, now, now as we work our way down here, I'm going to go over the tree. I'm going to go over much more of the tree than need be. And then when we come back to paint the tree, we're going to paint wet on wet directly into the paint. I haven't used any medium yet except for the odorless mineral spirits that was used to tone the canvas. So I'm deliberately painting a little more thick now around the tree, just because I know that I'm gonna go over this. And I'll show you a little paint handling trick uh, for painting wet into wet. Simple and easy. No need to stress about the shape of the tree or anything like that. Now there's a few distant clouds over here. So what do you say we just indicate them by just directly blending into the sky. A little bit more of the green, ultramarine blue green shade. And I'm thinking about how the paint color that I'm applying is interacting with the ivory black. So I think very much about how each brush stroke will add to the composition of the painting. Remember I'm composing not really drawing. So a little bit lighter down here. Okay, now you don't want to work the sky to death, but just have the simple abstraction in mind. What in the world? My easel is starting to make a noise. Which, by the way, I don't really recommend French easels for plein air painting. That they're made for that, but man, those things are heavy. If you have any ideas of what are the better easels to take for plein air painting, uh, please write them in the comments down below. Currently looking for a, a better setup for a travel easel. So we'll have some of the sky poking through back here. Maybe some clouds fitting in over there. Okay, so I'm going to clean off the brush a little bit with the odorless, odorless and mineral spirits, sorry. Paper towel. And now we're going to get into a different area. So let's just go right into the Terra Vert. Uh-oh, this, this one was starting to dry on me. A little bit of medium just to get the paint to flow. I didn't think any of these colors were particularly slow dryers, but it seems like the Terra Vert is a much more slow dryer than the others. So that's something to note. So going straight with the green. Kind of like zigzag brush strokes. Letting it blend right into the sky. The edges are also going to be fairly soft as shapes are very far away. Unless you're painting like a mountain that's like right across here or something. Now, as I was saying before, I don't have a brown in here. 
I want to deliberately mix all of my kind of earthy brown tones. So let's get into a little bit of magenta. So magenta, terra vert. So the magenta will help to basically neutralize the green and it will make sure that it's not too warm. I know magenta is kind of a warmish tone, but it's closer to the purple. Oops. It's closer to the purple, so you know, color theory. If you're closer to the purple, then it will be a little cooler than say a yellow. Because uh burnt umber raw umber or something like that will have a little bit of kind of a warmer kind of yellowish tone to it so this way we ensure our atmospheric perspective all right so now what i'm going to do is finally switch brushes so switching brushes yellow ochre so now we're going to mix on the palette so yellow ochre titanium white we want a lot of paint in the mixture. Nice and a healthy bristle brush. I prefer Robert Simmons. No, I'm not sponsored by them. It's just the type of bristle brush I prefer. And now we're going to start to put in a little plain And like I said, I'm just cutting right into where I placed that tree. I'm gonna leave this dark mark that I had there for that big old tree in the distance. And I don't wanna have a complete straight line. Maybe I'll just angle it a little bit. There, add some little nuance to that. I'm gonna go back to the darker color. I will mix on the palette again. Terra Vert, Magenta. I'm going to have to add more Terra Vert. Can't believe it's actually drying. So, that's a note to you. If you haven't worked with Terra Vert uh, as much, I certainly haven't. It dries a little faster than Sap Green. Now, you may be wondering why I use this over Sap Green. No reason in particular. I read a comment about uh, asking me why I prefer uh, Sap Green over Terra Vert, and I think I wrote, I responded because it's uh, a little bit cooler, the Terra Vert, in which it is. And now I'm going to put that darker shadow with the Terra Vert down here. covering much more ground than I necessarily need to. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more Terra Vert into that. All right, so I just added a little more Terra Vert. There we go. I also had to look at a YouTube video of how to pronounce it, Terra Vert. Yeah, if you look up the video on how to pronounce Terra Vert on YouTube, it's, it's pretty funny. A little more titanium white. Now we're gonna paint the light most facing plane over here. Just single little brush strokes. Put a light most facing plane there. And now I'm gonna go back to the Terra Vert. Mixing the Terra Vert and the green here. Now we're going to paint the indication of distant green, distant green grass, but still it's a tint, like a yellowish tint. And then we're going to go in and state this path a little more clearly later. Now with landscape, you want to put in a little bit more than you necessarily need. See how I'm kind of starting to sculpt this little tree mass into shape? It's 
See how the ivory black just leaves a little indication here of a pass without doing much work. A little bit more of a light facing plane there. Okay, all right, so now with the same old brush, I'm going to start to mix up this uh, warmer, tall grass tone. So let's add the yellow ochre, magenta, to make a little bit of a brownish tone. See how much darker that is? And we'll start to add our tones for the tall grass. And I know I've just obliterated the tree that was there before, but I'll put that tree back. See how we have little evidence here of the tree? I just wanna get the shape of that tree back before I forget to paint it in. Okay, so that's that. For the placement of the tree, hopefully this palette doesn't fall over. A little bit more magenta. I usually will put my paints in the freezer. It's just I kind of forgot after I came back from the painting session, plein air painting. I was so excited to finally paint plein air, I forgot to put my paints in the freezer. So I'm not going to completely eliminate the green that I put there. Just leave some of the green there. Right now what I want is a color change to indicate these, uh, the tall grass. And of course it's dried out grass because winter. Okay, now with the same brush, we're going to go right into the Terra Vert again. And with a little bit of a zigzag motion. Terra Vert, yellow ochre. See how I'm doing a lot of the mixing on the painting itself? Terra Vert, Titanium White, Yellow Ochre, and as you can tell, I, I kind of, uh, I, I enjoy an Impressionist type landscape a little more than, uh, say, like a very realistic one. It's just my taste, really. I've always been a fan of the Impressionists. Okay, now I'm gonna go back into the darker colors. I'm gonna restate the shadow. Add a little bit of ultramarine green shade. A little bit of medium. That might be too blue. So we'll just put in a little bit of the magenta, a little bit of the alizarin. Now we're gonna go back to the ivory black. A little bit of medium. Now I use the medium to get the paint to flow a little bit. It's pretty much the only reason I use the medium in this style of painting. So 
So I want to make sure that that dark value, that the dark value for the cast shadow is back. Back to the alizarin magenta. I'm going to put a shadow for the tall grass. Make sure that we don't repeat the same shapes too much. All right, now I'm going to switch brushes to a little synthetic brush. Add a little bit of mineral spirits to it. It's ivory black. Ultra, sorry, not ultra, um, Alizarin Permanent, Winsor Red, Sap Green, a little bit more Mineral Spirits. So remember, thinner paint tends to stick onto thicker paint. Now we're just putting in the little limbs for the tree. I'm very cautious of the symmetry now. All right, so now that I have kind of messed up the tree. I put too much symmetry in the tree. Now we're going to cover up our mistakes with the Terra Vert. So a little bit of Terra Vert. And now we're going to put little zigzags. To indicate the, um, the leaves. A little bit more medium. Now with the tree, you want to look at shape. A tree is very deceptive and it may be tempting to just kind of jump in and just tree. Uh, but you want to think about light and shadow mass with a tree. You know, I'm deliberately making some areas darker, like there, like some areas darker to indicate shadow mass. Now clearly this tree is all in shadow with just little glimpses here and there of light. A little bit more terra vert. Now everyone will conceptualize or simplify a tree in their own style, their own manner. You know, it's like it's like a brush stroke really. It's like uh, the brush stroke is the calligraphy of the individual artist. So if you look at a Monet, you see a lot of like curl, curl like brush strokes. You look at the sergeant, there's a lot of like that, like lean brush strokes. And remember symmetry. Watch out for the symmetry. You don't want to impose symmetry. It's human nature to want to see symmetry. In nature, there's not really that much symmetry. Unless you're talking bilateral symmetry in, in like a animal or 
something like that, like a starfish, but not so much with trees. Some little darker masses here. Okay, so now that we have that mass for the tree, let's go ahead and do the same thing with the larger tree. And as I put the stem for the tree, I'm also putting down the platform, like the, the grass behind it. It's kind of like a plane, just so the tree doesn't just all of a sudden appear out of nowhere. You want to have a base plane for the tree, a little bit of dioxazine purple, winter yellow, Winter yellow deep, that is. It's obviously not as strong as a cadmium yellow, but I don't want it to be as strong as a cadmium yellow. All right, so that helps me get a clean little brownish tone that's still a little bit cooler. Let's look at the little zigzags. A tree. A little more mineral spirits. Now clearly I don't see all of these um, branches. I'm not trying to paint the individual branches, but what I'm trying to do is just simplify what I'm seeing in a way that I'm cautious about the tendency, the human tendency to impose symmetry. You know, there's some little uh, twigs over here in the picture, but I, I think I might omit the twigs here for now. I'm putting many more little twigs than are than it is eventually going to show through. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to a different brush, another synthetic brush, but slightly larger. Go back to the Terra Vert, the Axazine Purple. A little more mineral spirits. Gonna apply these darker masses, a little bit of ultramarine blue. I really have to squint down at the image now to see what I can put in and what I can omit. So just Clean and simple little zigzag motions. Now just like with a human portrait or a figurative painting, you want to be mindful of edges as well. So using the same brush, I'm actually going to sharpen this edge, so the same color, and then blend it into this to try and make it a little bit lighter. Then I'm going to add more of the ivory black, ultramarine. So you want this to be darker than that and this to be a little bit sharper than that. 
even though it's cutting back in the distance. It's a very clean edge between the sky and the trees. Whereas the leaves for the trees, uh, they're not going to be as sharp. We're, I think it's going to be human tendency to try to impose a sharp edge just because we want to define everything, but let this be abstract. And let the brush strokes themselves imply the, um, the light and shadow. And just like with the other um, paint-alongs, I think I'm now reaching a point where I have to focus a little bit more. So I'll be a little bit more quiet now. Now, what you're seeing here, uh, this little light that you're seeing here is not deliberate. That's actually glare. So the canvas is glaring a little bit there, but it's not really much I can do with that. So now with the smaller brush, now that I have the trees indicated there, I'm going to now start to put in the smaller planes. So just like with a portrait, a human portrait, um, this is now consider this the large picture. So we now just painted in the big picture. Now we're going to start to go and look for all of the smaller little nuance shapes. And um, you know, with the human portraits, uh, I put in the color value web for the values to keep them organized. But with landscape, it's so much more abstract. I don't really follow that kind of procedure too much. Clean off the brush. I want to preserve this little light. I want to go back into the shadow. I still think it needs to get a little darker. Now we want to paint all these little planes. The planes and the tall grass. A little bit warmer. Now remember, I'm not coming at you like an expert in landscape painting. Remember, this is a paint along. This is not intended to create a perfect photographic image. I usually mention that in the beginning, but I think I forgot with this one, so I'll probably have some 
interesting comments. So this is not about creating a perfect photographic rendition of our model, which is nature. Um, nor is this to make a highly realistic landscape either. Um, this is a way to approach landscape painting in a kind of more systematic approach, so to speak, but at the same time allowing you to have freedom. A little more the red colors. We're going to mix directly into this. Remember the warmer colors when we're talking atmospheric perspective. The warmer colors are closer to you. The darker values are closer to you. I wouldn't want to put like red in the background or something like that. Put in some light behind this plane. Now I really have to squint down to see these values. Now I don't want my brush strokes to be predictable either. So I'm very cautious with the, the way the brush stroke is applied. Now clearly this whole tall kind of dead grass mass is going to have planes in it, so there's a lighter plane there. There's going to be a lighter plane over here. Now I'm going to change brush and move into the grass that's facing us more. So the terra vert, ivory black, a little bit of medium. Now we're going to go back to the zigzag motion. Now clearly this is too blue, so the tiniest bit of red, it's the winter red. Now with grass, grass can be kind of tricky, just like with everything else here, uh, with the grass you want to be extra cautious with symmetry. So we're putting in the shapes, uh, little tiny spots, if you will, or changes of color and value in the grass. What you don't want to do with the grass, um, well, I usually don't say don't do this, but I would suggest not to just make it flat. Uh, you want to put spots for grass. And the spots will get smaller and smaller the further away the grass is from you.
we're going to use this to put a little indication here of light on that tree mass. But now the light on tree, oh, light on tree, the light that you see on a tree mass like this is going to be so dark. but still noticeable. Let's put a little, another little, little spot there for a tree. Now I'm gonna switch brushes back to the tiny brush. A little bit of ultramarine blue. Tiny bit more medium or mineral spirits. You want to have as much plain as possible. Oh, I know I cut right through some of the trees, but I'll just put them back. It's fine. The more plain that you can show, the more depth you will have in your landscape, which is what we want. We really want depth. I'm going to go ahead and uh, re-simplify this tree. Ultramarine to revert. I want to be very cautious with the direction of each one of these brush strokes. Unlike with portrait painting, the brush stroke calligraphy kind of matters a little bit more. See, when you're painting a human portrait or a figure, it's not so much the brush stroke, but the information entailed by the brush stroke. You can say that's also true with landscape, but it's, uh, I'm cautious with how this will look. The camera just shut off a second there. I hope I didn't lose too much footage or any. I'm very cautious of this negative shape. I don't want this to be too similar to this, nor this distance to be too similar to this. And I think we can do it. I think we can put a few of the little twigs from the tree. A little more ultramarine, medium, so distant little twigs. Now I don't want this little third, imagine this is a third, right? One, two, three. These are three spaces now. I don't want the thirds to be too similar. And in the same way, I think of quadrants with composition. 
quadrants in a painting. So like one quadrant here, quadrant here, quadrant here, and then here. You have to think a lot about composition with landscape. Feel like I need to explain why this this is here so remember earlier I didn't want to put that tree yeah we're gonna just put a tree here now but not like the one we see we're gonna need something here to explain what's going on there I don't want the tree however to go all the way there I'm going to manipulate the image a little bit. So now that we have this little tree fragment there, I am going to move the shadow. Oh, isn't that fun? <laughs> that's the that's the real fun. Was alla prima, meaning wet on wet. Damn, look at that! You can literally move a shadow with a dry brush, no problem. So now this shadow is going to come from this tree. I think that just makes it more interesting if you ask me. But what's more, uh, now we're gonna do some very interesting stuff. I don't like uh, even numbers too much with composition. So I'm just gonna sneak another tree in here just to break up the uh, symmetry a little bit. See, we're taking visual information and we're interpreting it to create a painting. Oh, and such fun this is, <laughs> it's so much fun. You don't have to worry about the likeness or anything. A more plain here. So let me know if you would like more landscape. Um, you know there was a free image, images online, uh, pixels or something they're called the. Uh, the websites with the free image. I actually use those to practice landscape. Though for copyright reasons, I don't think I would trust putting that on YouTube too much. I'd rather take my own pictures, but who knows. You can also send me pictures that you took yourself. You can just send it to me through my website or just email me. If you have landscape pictures you would want me to paint on YouTube, go ahead and send them in. I'm going to add some little nuance to the shadow here, a little more blue. I'm kind of happy that I feel like this made a big difference. That is to same, like, uh, it's too flat. So I'm going to go ahead and titanium white, yellow ochre, Terravert, boom. Let's add some change. Boom. Have fun with the brush stroke. And then let's invent some green patches of grass there.
Now let's put in even more stuff here. It's a lot of mineral spirits. A lot of dried up grass here. It's winter. It's cold. So we want to make the grass look kind of dried up. A little more mineral spirits. Or you, can, you can see a lot more mineral spirits. And we're even going to put this into the shadow. So the shadow is being kind of manipulated by the, the blades of the grass. Such fun. Oh, the fun. All zigzag motions. Oh, this would be the life. You know, if I could travel, paint plein air, have a camera crew, do this from life, and then maybe I'll be fortunate enough that people would want to buy my paintings, the landscape paintings. Oh, that would be fun. Great way to make a living. That's just a dream. Now we're just kind of walking the shadow all the way back to its origin. A little tree. A little bit of magenta. You know, I think we can add some more nuance to the sky. Let's get another brush. I might regret this. I'm gonna have to clean another brush, but whatever. Let's add a little more nuance to this guy. Just kind of in the center here. So I helped push the clouds forward a little bit. Just, I feel it. I feel like something needs to be there. Remember? Not really drawing, I'm composing. Awesome. Who cares if it if it's there in the photo reference or not? No one cares. What matters is how the painting looks. Oh the fun. Look how that just brings the the clouds into focus a little more. It also kind of brings our attention towards the focal point, which is another thing that we should talk about with landscape. I don't really know what the focal point is. That's a mistake. Um, I would say the focal point is here. I feel like this area is busy enough right here that the eye would travel there first. You can build focal points by contrasting values and edges. So let's make this a little more contrast even edge over here. It should help to draw the eye a little closer to here. And putting this darker value actually I think will help pull this plane forward for this tree. And clearly you know, there's, this is a completely different shape than the 
the tree itself. So let's try to put in some little indications of light. Actually, I have to change a battery. All right, give me a second here. I have to change a battery. I'll be right back. All right, and we're back. I changed the battery and then painted for another, like, I don't know, five minutes. I changed the shape of the tree over here, uh, but I uploaded the footage on the computer and saw that that file went corrupt. So thank you, technology. Uh, so hopefully this clip uh, stays. So obviously you'll know if you're seeing this, right? Um, so. I just added a little bit more little patches of light there and then added a twig here. So I'm sorry you won't be able to see every single brush stroke. The camera kind of pooped out on me, so <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, just a few more little indications here for uh, some of the shape for the leaves. And I think I should call it with this landscape painting. We're going to add a little signature. And I thought for the outro, I would um, take the tape off of the uh, the corner so you would see what the painting actually looks like after all of the extra tape was removed. Of course, there's still a little tape up there, but in any case, you can see what the painting actually looks like now. That being said, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to see more painting demonstrations such as this one, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you would like to support this channel even more, I also have a patreon account and if you would be interested in purchasing any of the oil paintings uh, that i create i also have links to my etsy shop down below also down below are links to my website to the classes that i teach and information on the uh, oil colors that i'm using and the brushes and all of that thank you so much for watching and i'll see you on the next one and it's now time for our new patron shout outs so thank you thank you so much shirley ross miller and thank you thank you so much x x e r g g h e r i'm not sure how to pronounce that one so i decided to spell your name out and i hope that's okay thank you thank you so much richard demont Thank you, thank you so much, Glorianne Galba Lockyer. And thank you, thank you so much, Kelly Snyder. I'd like to thank all of you so much for your support on my Patreon account. It really, really means the world to me. And remember, this Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, which means that you will have the live chat. So go ahead, log into Patreon, and you'll see the link. Just before the live stream is up, you will have the link to view it. And remember, next week is the first Saturday of the month. So you will have the link to the live stream painting demonstration next Saturday. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. And I'll see you on the next episode.